Um, we have weeds, wildflowers, and trees of Papscani Island. And uh, Papscani Island is kind of a favorite place of mine, so I thought we would share this today. I've never done this PowerPoint before. Uh, usually what we're doing at Papscani Island this time of the year is what's called the Hudson Valley Ramble. Uh, so that's an event that I'll tell you a little bit about. And uh, we do that every year at Papscani Island. So this is just a picture I stole off the uh, Google of an aerial view of Papscani Island. Uh, the Hudson River's over there on the left. Uh, Papscani Island is the, where the preserve is, is kind of underneath my words, weeds, wildflowers, and trees of Papscani Island. And you can see you get there by Stotts Island Road and River Road, which is uh, known as 9J. And this is in the town of Skodak, New York. So um, usually what we do this time of the year is we have an event in the calendar of the Hudson Valley Ramble. Now the Hudson Valley Ramble is an, um, kind of a number of organizations sponsor a whole month's worth of outdoor outings in the Hudson Valley. And you can go hiking, you can go bird watching, you can go kayaking, canoeing, all sorts of wonderful things in the Hudson Valley on these sponsored uh, activities, most of them in September. So normally we would do our uh, Hudson Valley Ramble at Papscani Island on a Saturday or Sunday morning. And we would have a group of maybe 10, 15 people that would join us and we would wander around Papscani Preserve and take a look at the plants. So if you want more information about the Ramble, this is the website, of course, the ramble is not happening this year due to the pandemic. So that's why I guess we're doing this virtually. Um, otherwise, we would have been out there maybe this past Saturday or Sunday morning and walking through the preserve. Uh, this is just a page of the sponsors, uh, the DEC, uh, National Park Service, a number of wonderful organizations there. And Cooperative Extension, in the form of me, is very happy to be part of that. And one of the perks I get for doing this is I get a t-shirt. And I've been doing this ramble for probably 10 or 15 years. So I have t-shirts with the Hudson Valley Ramble boot print on them and just about every color of the rainbow. I have one on today. I wore a blue one, which you can't see now, but here's one of the green ones. So I get a t-shirt out of it, which is kind of fun. So today we're going to Papscani Island Nature Preserve. This is a piece of land that's managed by the Rensselaer County Environmental Management Council. Uh, headed up by a wonderful woman named Ann Shaughnessy. Ann is a good friend of mine, and she is in charge of taking care of Papscani Island. She has some summer helpers. She doesn't really have a full-time crew, and she's uh, got sort of limited resources, but they do an incredible job of keeping the litter picked up and the trails open. And um, when you see my pictures here, you're going to see that's a big job. This place has got a lot of lush vegetation to it and there's trees falling down, and uh, Anne has to go out and keep the paths open, and normally Anne would be with us um, for our Hudson Valley Ramble, and she's actually the one that sets it all up, so that's a shout out to Anne, and here's a picture of us on one of our ramble, uh, in, rambles in the past. Uh, the address of the Papscani Island Preserve is Stotts Island Road, Castleton on Hudson, 12033. Um, if you're interested in going there, you just take 9J south from the city of Rensselaer. Um, I don't know how many miles it is. It's four or five miles outside of the city of Rensselaer, and it will be on your right-hand side. I always go in the south entrance. There also is also a north entrance up closer to the city of Rensselaer, which I am not too familiar with. So um, that's the south entrance that I usually go to. And the ramble is a lot of fun. Um, here's a young person that came along one year. We get all sorts of folks that are just curious about this area. They like the Hudson River. They want to go out and take a walk around on a beautiful September day. So it's a lot of fun to see who shows up and we meet some very interesting people. So again, here's my aerial view. I've blocked out the preserve there in kind of that long rectangle. So you can see it's a long piece of land that's along the Hudson River, uh, right on the river. And uh, it's a really beautiful spot because uh, we have a limited number of places we can actually go down to the river and, and actually look at the water and actually, if we wanted to, stick our feet in there. Um, about 
oh, about six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, I launched my kayak from Papscani Island and kayak down to Skodak Island State Park, uh, which took about two hours, two and a half hours. It was a lot of fun. So it's a great piece of land. I'm glad it's preserved. Uh, we won't have condos or Walmarts or anything like that built on this piece of land, which is wonderful. So again, you take 9J South, you turn right on Stotts Island Road if you're coming from the north. Um, of course, Albany is at the top of my picture. They're not being shown, but that's about where we are. Okay, so uh, here's our entrance. So there's the sign, you look for that. And we go down this wonderful dirt road and it's really kind of a cool experience because you know, you're know you maybe coming from the city, coming from Albany or a more developed place and you go down this dirt road and it feels like sort of this undiscovered piece of land. It's a lush piece of land close to the Hudson River and it's quite beautiful. Uh, we cross over on the dirt road, Papscani Creek. And this is a tidal creek. This water level will be going up and down um, as the tide goes in and out because this connects to the Hudson River. And it's kind of interesting when you go by to see, is there water in here or is there uh, low water and just a lot of mud. But there's a lot of interesting uh, vegetation along these banks of the creek. And here you can see Albany in the distance. So again, you get this feeling of being sort of out, maybe not in the wilderness, but in a, in a uh, open space area, but yet we're very close to the city and all that uh, urban development. So along the banks of Papscani Creek, back in that last picture, you can see it pretty well. On the left-hand side, there's a tall plant with kind of a fuzzy seed head on the top. And on the right-hand side, there's a lower growing plant. And that's kind of the battle of the two uh, plants that are found in these wetlands. On the left-hand side of my picture, you're seeing Phragmites or the giant reed. And this is an invasive plant. It's taken over a lot of wetlands in New York State and certainly in the United States. And we don't particularly like this because it displaces a lot of the native plants. And it's not a particularly good food plant for a lot of the uh, animals and insects that are in the uh, ecology ecological system in this, this kind of uh, marshy area. On the right hand side is a picture of the cattail. Now that's what should be growing there. And unfortunately the cattails are kind of getting displaced by the Phragmites. But I guess one of my messages here today is that we don't want to plant invasive species. I've had a number of people call me or ask me about this uh, Phragmites. They don't know what it is, but they want to plant it in their yard. They think it's attractive. And I said, oh, you don't want to do that. Not only is it not good for your yard or your neighborhood, we don't want to spread these invasive plants around. So here's a picture of the farm fields uh, that we go by on the dirt road uh, going to Papscani Island Preserve. And this is a very historic piece of land. Uh, Kilian Van Rensselaer bought Papscani Island from the Mohicans in 1637. The native peoples actually farmed this area well before the Europeans came. So this is some of what we would say is the oldest farmland in the United States because the native peoples recognized this as rich soil and a good place to grow crops. And this land was named for um, a sachem or a wise uh, leader uh, named Papscani, um, who was one of the Mohicans. Uh, so this land again was farmed by the Native Americans in a very early time. And then by the Europeans, because when they arrived, they knew a good thing when they saw it and they displaced the Native Americans. Another thing that we always want to think about is that this is a floodplain for the Hudson River. And uh, when we had Irene and Lee a few years back, this was underwater. So really it can't be built on very easily. Um, and periodically it floods. Um, that's a good and a bad thing. Uh, it's bad if you have crops there, but it also brings in maybe potentially more soil, uh, may bring in some pollutants too nowadays. So floodplains are interesting um, ecosystems and that's really what we have here um, on this very low flat land along the Hudson. Uh, the other thing that happened was that this area became very important for transportation. Uh, of course there was a lot of shipping on the Hudson River and after the Civil War uh, they started to dredge the Hudson River so bigger ships could come up to Albany in uh, our area, and they would dump the spoils of the dredge behind Papscani Island and really filled in a lot of the areas. So it's not quite 
as much of an island as it used to be. And that's where when we get into the preserve, there's some rough terrain and I think a lot of that soil comes from that dredging activity. Uh, also another form of transportation that came along was the Hudson or was the New York Central Railroad in the 1850s. So we crossed the tracks and we look both ways very carefully because the trains go very fast. And we come to this part of the road and we turn right and go into the parking lot by the sign here that is the start of the preserve. Um, now you don't go down this road any farther because if you do, you come to the Stotts house, which is a private home that was built in the 1690s and it's still owned by the same family. It's not open to the public um, and that's really their, their road beyond this site. So we don't go down that way. So the preserve has 150 acres. It's about 2.6 miles of trails, a number of signs and kiosks. And here in the parking lot, we have a nice map that we can orient ourselves with. And we have blue trails and red trails and white trails and green trails uh, and yellow trails. And uh, they're all very well marked. Uh, here someone has posted um, the bird species that have been seen recently, which is kind of fun. Uh, I'm not a bird person. I'm very interested in birds, but I, I know bald eagles and I know robins. And then beyond that, I get a little confused. But let's start looking at the plants, and that's really what we're here to do today on our ramble, our virtual ramble. And before we leave the parking lot, I usually bring people out along the, the dirt road and take a look at some of the sun-loving plants, because once we get into the preserve proper, it's very, very shady, and a lot of these species don't live inside that area. They live near the field or the parking lot um, in the sun. So here's one called chicory. Now, a lot of folks might know this. It has a very beautiful sky blue flower. It has a very big tap root that has been used for coffee and as a food source. And actually, chicory uh, doesn't look like much. It's kind of a scrappy uh, introduced plant. It doesn't have very pretty leaves on it, although the flowers are very pretty. But this is sort of one of those plants that's a powerhouse of nutrients. Um, it could be compared to like cranberries or some of these other superfoods. I have a list here that chicory has zinc, magnesium, manganese, calcium, iron, potassium, vitamin A, B6, C, E, and K. So it's just this incredibly powerful plant that concentrates these nutrients and manufactures uh, things that are actually beneficial for humans. Uh, so it has been used in the past as a food additive, uh, especially for coffee. And if you cut the flowers of this plant, which look so pretty, they fade very quickly. So it's not a very good cut flower plant. A lot of people know Queen Anne's lace. You'll find that out by the parking lot. This, of course, is a plant from Afghanistan, not a native plant, but it's certainly a wild flower for us now because it's naturalized. It's in the carrot family. So it too has a very large carrot-like root. And it's said to um, look like lace. It's got this umbel structure of all these tiny white flowers. And I don't have a good picture of it here, unfortunately. But in the center of that white cluster of tiny flowers is one red flower. And the one red flower is said to be a drop of blood from Queen Anne at, uh, that formed when she pricked her finger tatting the lace. So there you go, that's Queen Anne's lace. Uh, some people have used this as a cut flower and Martha Stewart made this popular a number of years ago. Now, one that you won't see this year because a lot of mowing has happened around the parking lot, unfortunately, is this one. Sometimes we find pokeweed in this area. And pokeweed, I just had to throw in here, these are pictures not from Papscani Island, but from a place nearby where there's pokeweed growing this year that wasn't mowed down. I just wanted to put this in here because I love pokeweed. It's a big, bold plant, five, six, seven feet tall. It has white flower clusters that turn into these dark purple berries and the berries were used as ink um, and as uh, dye in past years. Uh, but we have to be very careful with pokeweed because it's virtually all poisonous. The only way that you can eat pokeweed is if you cut the shoots in the very early spring and boil it three times and change the water in between each time you boil it. Then it's safe to eat, but only in the very early spring. Otherwise, this is a very powerfully poisonous plant and it can cause vomiting, spasms, convulsions, and death from respiratory failure. So 
you know, stay away from this guy. It's really beautiful. Uh, you can touch it, but don't, don't ingest it. Uh, but the interesting thing is that in Southern culture, there's a lot of uh, talk and, and lore about Pope weed. And this guy, Elvis, the 1970s Elvis here, sang a song called Pope Salad Annie. And one of my favorite lines from the song is, everyone said it was a shame her mama was working on the chain gang. So you get the idea of this kind of rough existence, but they were eating poke salad. So uh, that was kind of those hard times back in the past of Elvis. And actually there was at one point, I think, a cannery in Arkansas that produced poke salad greens that you could buy in a can. And south of the Mason-Dixon line, this is still a thing in the spring, you can go to poke salad festivals, but that's not really a thing up here in the north. But it's a very interesting plant nonetheless. And one that you can see definitely this year at Pabst Candy is this one, it's called white snake root. Again, um, this is a native plant and it has a very interesting past. Um, this one is a very pretty white fuzzy-like flower this time of the year. This picture was just taken a few days ago, I believe. And um, it's very attractive, but the problem is that this plant contains a chemical called Tremetol. And Tremetol, um, if it's ingested, remains in the bloodstream of the animal that ingests it. So what would happen back in the early days of the settlers who were pushing out into the Midwest was that their cattle would eat this white snake root and the milk would be tainted by this chemical named Tremetol and the Tremetol would actually kill people. It killed many hundreds or maybe, maybe many thousands of people in the early 1800s. And it killed the most notable person, one of the most notable mothers in our country, the mother of Abraham Lincoln actually died from this in 1818. And it wasn't until the 1830s when a woman doctor named Anna Bixby started to figure out this was what was killing the settlers in Illinois and Ohio and uh, Kentucky and places like that. And it took a long time for that actually to be recognized. But white snake root is very pretty, but we don't want our cattle to eat it. And one of the kind of interesting things is that um, this has actually been brought into the garden. This is called chocolate snake root. You can buy this plant in a nursery and it's got very uh, kind of purpley brown stems. And this is in my backyard. I took this picture last night and it's just about to bloom and have those white flowers. So this is a, a cousin of that native wild plant that you can grow in your garden, which is kind of fun. Okay, another plant with a kind of interesting history. We might see this one at um, Papscani if it wasn't mowed, is called pile wart. I put my bicycle in the picture there. This gets up to six, seven feet tall. It has a very nondescript little flower, but this time of the year, that picture on the left-hand side, it makes this fuzzy white material which uh, lets the seeds flow around. And we get a lot of questions about this plant because people think this is the giant hogweed. It doesn't really look anything like the giant hogweed. This one is kind of harmless. Um, it's not poisonous in that same sense, but it's kind of an interesting plant. And one we should make mention of is that we often see a little patch of loose strife growing out by the gravel road. Uh, this is an invasive plant. It's very pretty. I just had somebody email me and they wanted to know what this plant was and they wanted to plant it in their garden. And again, I said, don't plant this in your garden because uh, this is very invasive, especially in wetland areas. And um, it's, it's not a good thing. It's taken over a lot of um, areas where it shouldn't be. Uh, Cornell University, a number of years ago, introduced some beetles that eat the purple loose strife. And I think we need a, another infusion of those beetles to keep this at bay. So let's go down the path and see uh, what we can see inside the preserve, uh, underneath the very large trees. Uh, sometimes we have a few things that have come down. It's kind of a jungly atmosphere. It's very fun to walk in Papscani because it's so different than uh, some of the other places you might walk. The paths are very wide and very well maintained, uh, but we do see lots of vines. So I want to just mention some of the vines that we find climbing up the very large trees there. It gives it, again, a very tropical look. We can look off in the distance and see these big trees covered with these vines and this kind of southeastern Asian, very dense jungle. So it's a very interesting place to walk through uh, and see what's going on. So one of the plants that we will see a little bit of is poison ivy. So I wanted to point that out. Of course, poison ivy 
is uh, the plant that causes very uh, problematic rashes for most people. If you get this oil that it produces on your skin, a lot of people will have raised bumps and very itchy uh, skin on that area of their body. And if you scratch it enough, you can spread it. If you burn poison ivy, the smoke can actually get into your lungs and infect you that way. So it's a very powerful plant. It has leaves of three. You can see the leaves of three in those clusters there. Sometimes the leaves have uh, serrations on the edges, sometimes they don't. Normally they're kind of this medium green. In the fall they're very pretty shades of orange and red and purple. Poison ivy can grow along the ground. It can grow up a tree like in my other picture here. It can be a shrub, it can be a small tree. Learn what this looks like if you're going to spend any time outside. And um, you might want to wear long pants when you're in an area like this with the threat of poison ivy. And this is a picture I took a couple weeks ago at Papsgani. Uh, the poison ivy does make berries, which these are spread by birds, unfortunately. And these will turn white uh, very soon, and that will spread, it aid in the spread of poison ivy. So um, be aware of it. It's really an important plant to know. If I, I guess if I had to say to people, if you learn one plant in your life, <laughs> and you live in the Northeast, you might want to learn what poison ivy looks like because it can save you a lot of trouble uh, and keep you from getting that horrible rash. Um, a plant that's sometimes blamed for looking like poison ivy is Virginia creeper. Uh, this is not poison ivy. It's got leaves of five, but it is a vine. It often grows in the same kind of situations as poison ivy. But take a look there. You can see those clusters of five leaves. It's actually a very pretty vine. It's a native. Uh, to our area. And we don't really grow this in gardens, but I've been to England and Scotland where they actually grow this in their gardens and they think of this as a very attractive plant from North America. We kind of ignore it. Um, it will have that pretty fall color very soon. And it doesn't really get too far out of control. It's vigorous, but not overly vigorous. Uh, one that we've had some questions about recently here in the office, we had pictures sent to us, people saying, is this a wild grapevine? And yes, we do have wild grapevines of a couple different species in our area. And of course, they're at Papscani as well. Uh, the picture on the left right there, I took in early August and the grapes were just turning uh, purpley color. Those grapes are probably all gone by now because this is a great wildlife food plant. So there are wild grapes. They are edible for humans. Um, you know, be careful picking them. But if you know what the plant is, um, you, may, you may be able to sample some wild grapes. But the plant that really causes most of the problems, I would say, at Papscani Island, and actually in a lot of Rensselaer County and up along the Hudson River and uh, all the counties, would be Oriental Bittersweet. This is the plant that really grows very tall, way up into the trees, makes a very sturdy vine, and you can see it's kind of got a green leaf, uh, very nondescript. It has these green berries on it. This was taken in August and these will turn that very brilliant red to orange color and that's why people cut this and put this on their uh, Thanksgiving table and use this as ornamental wreaths and that's why it was brought here in the 1860s. The trouble is it likes our climate a little too much and it has escaped and become a very very problematic weed. So it has a very big root system. Once it gets established it's really hard to get rid of. I Kid you not, I had a question this morning about this. So don't plant this. If you use it as a decoration, which is not really a great idea, put it in the trash. Make sure it's not going to spread anywhere else. By golly, don't put it in your compost pile. And here are some of the examples of the vines. Very thick, very heavy vines climbing up the trees at Papscani Island. And they shade out the trees. They pull down the trees. They, they do cause quite a bit of damage on the trees. A couple smaller vines, just as a note, this is one called the hog peanut vine. This is a little guy, it only gets to about eight feet tall, but it's a native plant. It's kind of fun. It's got three leaves, so you'd have to distinguish this from poison ivy, but this is kind of a much more delicate thing, and it has a little pink flower. And it also makes a little flower near the ground that's self-fertile and can actually grow underneath the soil and form sort of a peanut-like uh, structure and that's why it gets its name and this could be one of those native plants if you learned it you could actually uh, dine on or eat. Um, another little vine that's out there not too much uh, this found in Papscani 
It's called climbing buckwheat. I took this picture the other day. Kind of an interesting plant. The flower is very small and it makes these sort of uh, little seed pods that are forming on it now. It scrambles up to about 15 feet tall. Uh, you don't want to plant this in your garden even though it's a native because it can be a little bit rampant. And somebody figured out how to make buckwheat flour out of this. And I don't know how many of those seeds you would need to do that with, but you'd probably have to have a lot of patience and collect a heck of a lot of this to make climbing buckwheat flour, but kind of an interesting thing. So then we find at Papskani some plants that you might actually find in your garden. And one of the ones I always remark on when we're on a ramble doing our walk is hosta. Now people, you know, pay money to buy hosta at a garden center and plant it in their yard. And then of course the deer come and eat it because the deer like hosta. I happen to love hosta. I think it's one of my favorite plants. And there's a few wild hostas that have gone native and are, are living at Papskani Island. So even if something like a hosta will escape cultivation, it hasn't really become an invasive weed, but there are a few wild hostas find, you can find growing in the shade at Papskani Island. One of the more colorful plants you'll find right now in bloom, this time of the year in September, is this one called sneezeweed. Now this gets a bad rap because this does not make you sneeze. It's actually blooming at the same time that the uh, ragweed is blooming, and the ragweed is the plant that causes the allergies. The sneezeweed is perfectly fine. Um, people are not allergic to this, but it's a very pretty plant. And this has become a plant that's sold in garden centers and nurseries as a native plant that people might enjoy. Um, I planted sneezeweed in my garden, and I had it for a few years, and then it disappeared, and then I tried again, and I had it for a few years, and it disappeared. And then I saw it at Papskani and I realized I have the wrong site for this. This patch of sneezeweed is not very common and it's growing right on the riverbank down by the river. So it's got very damp soil and my garden is too dry. So if, if you have planted this and not succeeded in your garden, it might be because the soil is too dry. I really learned from my uh, looking around at Papskani Island that this really wants a damp soil. Uh, this one is a weed though. This will grow anywhere. I have this in my garden quite a bit in shady areas and people get, uh, give us questions about this one too. They don't know what it's called. It's called clear weed. Now this will be a weed that grows maybe mm, 18 inches tall. It's got very shiny foliage. It's actually kind of attractive. It loves shade um, and dampish kind of places. I have it under some of my shrubs and on the edge of my woods. And in Papskani Island, it's very prolific in those shady areas. It's in the nettle family. And that picture in the inset there, you can see it's got kind of these tiny little green flowers on it, but it doesn't have any stinging barbs. So it's safe to touch. Um, it won't harm you. You can pull this out and uh, clear weed is rather benign, I guess you could say. Uh, a plant I had a question about again this morning, privet. Somebody called us and said, when can I prune my privet hedge? Well, privet is an invasive. It's escaped cultivation, uh, and you can find it growing at Papskani Island in the woods. Uh, you can see the picture on the right there. It has a lot of berries on it. Um, you know, privet's kind of fallen out of favor in landscapes. It's a lot of work to keep pruning it, and it is invasive, so we don't see it sold quite as bit as it used to be, but it was a very popular hedge at one time, um, and now it's kind of in the woods growing um, on its own. Uh, one of my favorite plants that you'll find at Papskani, this again down by the water or the river, is the Joe Pye weed. And Joe Pye has a very pretty sort of light purple flower cluster on it. These are actually probably finishing up. I took this picture in August and now this will be finishing up and turning kind of brown and done for the season. But Joe Pye weed might grow five, six feet tall. Um, its name is kind of shrouded in mystery. Joe Pye was a fellow that lived in 19th century New England. Uh, we know he was maybe um, a Native American healer or he was maybe um, a settler that was into uh, Native American lore. His background is very obscure, but this plant somehow was named for him. It's a very powerful medicinal plant. It has lots of medical properties. Uh, people used to use the hollow stems for drinking straws and as blow guns to apply medicine. The roots were made into a love potion. And one of the craziest things I read about this was 
A pregnant woman who was ill from smelling a corpse was told to bathe in water steeped in Joe Pye weed. So I don't know that we use any of those cures anymore, but it is a very nice garden plant as well as a very interesting native plant. Um, and another one that you might find at Papscani is this one called Sol False Solomon Seal. This is a small, low-growing plant with very pretty green foliage. And normally this would have white flowers or red berries at the end. But this one you can see um, was probably eaten by a deer and it has some slug damage. But this is a nice plant if you have a shade garden. Uh, this would be a nice native plant to have in your shade garden. Um, one of the really fun plants that you'll see at Papscani is this one called Touch me not or jewel weed. This one grows fairly tall. This will be, oh, over my head, six, seven feet tall sometimes. It can grow shorter as well. It loves shady, damp places. There's lots of this at Papscani Island in the rich soil along the river. Um, and there's two types. There's impatience pallida, which is the yellow one, which is this one. And you're gonna say, that doesn't look like an impatience plant. And I would say you're kind of right. Impatience is a big, genus. There's lots of different types of impatience and it doesn't really look like the one we use as a bedding plant. But if anybody's ever grown old-fashioned annual plants, there's one called balsam that they used to grow and it's um, an impatience really and it looks a lot like this. So if you were to grow in balsam impatience, it would look a lot like this jewel weed. So it's got a very pretty uh, yellow flower in this case and maybe you can see there those long kind of narrow little seed pods that are forming. And the trick with this plant is if you touch the seed pod right when it's ripe, it kind of springs open and actually can eject its seeds. And that's why it's called touch me not because if you touch it, it kind of explodes, which is kind of fun. Uh, the other species is called Impatience capensis, which is the orange jewel weed, also very pretty. Um, and this one was named capensis by the old botanists who got it wrong. They thought that this plant came from South America, the Cape of, uh, Cape of Good Hope. No, that's the Cape of Cape Town, South Africa, I, I guess I would say. So they thought the plant came from the other part of the world. They didn't realize it was native to North America and they gave it the wrong name, Capensis. It's really native here. And if you find this in your yard, you might leave a patch of it. It's kind of fun to have as a native plant. And one of the things I also like about it is that it's a pollinator plant. Um, a lot of different bees and butterflies and even hummingbirds will be attracted to this. And there's something, uh, a structure on the flower called the nectar spur. And that little circle that's popped up there is where the nectar is produced in the flower. And the hummingbird or the bee or the butterfly has to come and get that nectar way out of that spur, the very bottom of the flower. And that really is a trick that the plant is playing to make sure that it gets its pollen spread around and on the pollinating uh, animal and moved around. So that's the nectar spur. Um, another interesting plant with an interesting name at least is called Enchanter's Nightshade. Uh, this is a small plant about two feet tall. It's got a very tiny flower in my kind of lousy out of focus picture there. But this little flower turns into a little seed pod that has barbs on it. And if you walk in the woods in October and November, you'll often get little round seeds stuck on your shoes and on your pant legs, and it can be this enchanter's nightshade. And this again is another one that was named wrong. Um, it's not in the nightshade family, uh, which would be plants like tomato and potato and some poisonous plants. It's not in that family at all, and it really doesn't have a lot of medicinal properties. Um, so the name was not really a good one for this plant, although it's a great name. It sounds very mysterious and interesting. And then there's some definite plants you don't want in your garden. And one of my favorites at Papscani Island is actually this one, it's kind of a nasty thing. It's called the Canada Wood Nettle. And I don't see this in a lot of other places in Rensselaer County. It really likes damp soil. It likes to be along the a river in those woods. And it grows in very big patches. And you can see the picture on the left-hand side there. It's got a very stout stem. This will die back towards the ground. Uh, there's either plants that have male and female flowers or, or single-sex plants. And those kind of lacy structures on there are actually the flowers. Up the top is the female flower, and those lower flowers along the stem are the male flowers. 
And why is this kind of a nasty plant? It's covered in tiny little barbs. Maybe you can kind of see in that picture, it looks like there's some white fuzz on there. And those are stinging nettles on those stems. I didn't really get a good picture here for you, but it's a very uh, powerful plant because you don't want to touch those barbs and you don't want to walk into this plant because it will sting, it will give you a rash. And it's in that group of uh, plants we do call the stinging nettles. So be aware of it. The other funny thing about this plant is its name. It's called Laportia. Now Laportia was named for a French guy. The French guy's name was Francois Louis de Laporte, Count of Castanau. Now with a name like that, you would think he was a very important person. And indeed he was a French naturalist. He was a diplomat and a botanist. And um, he traveled to many different parts of the world. And he was quite a character, supposedly. Um, my research has found that Laporte, this gentleman, had at least two wives, both at the same time. He had a son who gave his butler no end of trouble. And he was tall, stooped, and neglectful of his appearance. Some of his fellow botanists described him as warm-hearted and generous. Um, others described him as mean and aloof. And the interesting thing is, why did a plant with stinging nettles on it get named for a man uh, in particular, this Laporte gentleman? Well, I think the guy, another French botanist named Hugh Algernon Waddell, named it for Laporte because he didn't like Laporte. Uh, they probably were having a botanical feud of some sort, and Laporte or uh, Waddell decided he would name this nasty plant for Laporte. So that's why it's called Laportia. So it's a native plant, but one you might not want in your garden. Uh, mugwort, this gives some of our master gardeners and other people uh, headaches. This is one that came over from the old country. It's called mugwort because it was used to make beer or flavor beer. And of course, beer you have in a mug. So that's where it got its name of mugwort. It has a very big underground root system. It can grow six, seven feet tall. It's actually kind of a pretty thing, but it makes very big patches and it's a very hard weed to eradicate. Another name for it is wormwood and it would be called wormwood if you would, were to take this, ingest this plant to get rid of the worms in your digestive tract. So luckily most of us don't have that problem at the moment. But wormwood or artemisia, you really don't wanna plant this in your garden. There's herbs uh, that look similar to this. I have one called Artemisia lactiflora. And there's also absinthe made from Artemisia, but don't get the wrong Artemisia and plant it in your garden because you can have a lot of problems. These are the flowers. I just thought this was interesting. The flowers are very tiny. It doesn't really reproduce significantly by its flowers. It spreads by the underground rhizomes. So eventually we do get to the river and here's a picture of the river looking north. Uh, towards Albany. Uh, you can see it's a low tide, so the banks are exposed and there's lots of rocks there. But I always just think it's a lot of fun to visit the Hudson River. I think it's a very sort of magical place. We see it, um, you know, from driving by it on 787, but to actually get out and look at it and maybe put your boat in the water and take a little sail or, or take a walk along the banks, it's a wonderful thing. Across the other side, we see Van Rees Point over in Albany County with a lot of very lovely homes there. And we also see to the south some aids to navigation. And one of my, the one thing I know about navigation is that you want the red marker like this one on your right hand side when you return from the ocean to keep in the channel. So when you see these markers in the Hudson River, always think of this little saying red right returning. And that will show you where the channel is in the Hudson. And in this case, it would be out towards the right-hand side of the picture. That's where the big ships would want to go. Um, and on the riverbank, of course, we have lots of the same plants, and they're kind of clinging on to life here. It's very gravelly. And that lower little picture there is the mugwort growing right on the bank. That big uh, rhizomatous root system allows it to stay there. And some of the trees have become undermined over time. Uh, back when I was there on Monday, this big tree that had been there for many years fell down and it's kind of adding some interest to the landscape right on the riverbank. So let's finish up with some of the trees that you'll find at Papscany Island. And again, 
There's lots of magnificent trees. You'll notice there's lots of big, big specimens um, on this uh, patch of the river bank. And it's really kind of fun to look at these very large trees, some of them being engulfed by the vines and some of them not. Um, but I kind of worry about these big trees because we are, um, we are seeing a lot of them being uh, taken over by the vines. But even maybe more important, are there small native trees such as cottonwoods coming in? Uh, we don't see a lot of small trees moving into an area like this because of these vines and some of these are very aggressive things. So what will Papscani look like in a hundred years? I don't know. I don't know if the native trees will come back and regenerate. Um, so it's kind of an interesting question. Are these uh, trees producing seedlings that are going to replace them for the future? Um, and it's certainly the big trees that you'll see at Papscani are the cottonwoods. Uh, this is just two pictures of these magnificent cottonwood trees. They're very, very tall, up to about 100 feet tall. Uh, they have very, very rugged sort of um, very ridged kind of medium brown to gray bark. They're very distinctive when you learn what they are and they're very, very attractive too. Uh, there are male and female um, cottonwood trees. The females make that fuzzy cotton that you'll find in the spring along with the seeds that sometimes annoys people if it comes down in great quantity. Um, and cottonwoods usually aren't planted in the landscape because they don't make particularly good landscape trees. They grow fast, but they're weak wooded and they tend to fall down. So they're not great to plant near your house. So we often just see these in natural areas and along the river and they can tolerate the flooding and they can tolerate the drought. So they're very well adapted to this Hudson Valley floodplain. Um, another favorite tree of mine, of course, is the black walnut. There's a number of these at Papscani. This has compound foliage. It's called pinnately compound foliage. The picture on the right hand side there shows the many small leaves that make up, or many of the small leaflets that make up the leaves of the black walnut. And of course, it's a very uh, important food plant for things like squirrels and chipmunks because it does make very large quantities of walnuts. And of course, they would have been a food source for the native people as well as the early settlers as well. Uh, the black walnut can grow in the floodplain. It also can grow up on the higher terrain in the drier soil. So it's a very adaptive plant and um, very attractive tree. I have one in my front yard, which I like quite a bit. It does make a chemical called juggalone and produce a sort of a toxic area in the soil. So it does keep out some other competition from around it through this allelopathic chemistry that it's capable of, which is kind of an interesting thing. As we said before, these, a lot of these plants are chemical warehouses or powerhouses or chemical generators. They can make all these fascinating chemicals that uh, we're just really learning about. Another fantastic tree, of course, is the American sycamore or the American plane tree. Again, another native tree we find at Papscani Island. It's got these very broad, large leaves with, green, uh, with teeth on the edges. And uh, I was looking at this the other day when I took this picture and I thought, look at that stem there where it has almost that little jester's sort of collar around uh, the stem there. I wonder what that's called. And it's called a leafy stipule. Whoops, it's called a leafy stipule. I don't know too many other plants that have that little structure there. And what would evolution give that structure to the sycamore for? I have no idea what the purpose of that is, but it's kind of an interesting little thing. Of course, the most uh, notable thing about the sycamore is that it's uh, got beautiful bark. It's got white, uh, underneath, white bark underneath and patches of grays and browns and greens, and it kind of exfoliates and falls off. And when the trees get large, they can be very impressive uh, with this beautiful bark. And I like to take photographs of the bark of the sycamore because they're very distinctive. And in the winter, you can go to places like Papscani or along some of the other creeks and rivers in Rensselaer County, and you'll see these beautiful sycamores uh, very clearly in the winter time when there's no leaves on the trees. So here they are, they're very pretty bark. Um, the sycamore doesn't make a very good uh, city tree. Um, it's got a cousin, which is actually a hybrid called the London plane tree, which actually can be planted in cities. It's very urban tolerant, very smoke tolerant. It was developed in London back in the 1800s. So we occasionally see that used as a street tree, not, not, not so much this native version of it. 
Uh, the trouble with the even the London plane tree is it grows very large, and large trees in cities tend to cause some problems. So it doesn't get used quite a bit, quite as much as it used to. But here's one that actually has almost white bark. It's so exfoliated, it's got almost white bark. So they're very pretty. And if you go to Papscani, look up into the treetops and see if you can see these sycamore trees because they're kind of scattered here and there. And another tree we always visit because there's really very few of these. I only know of one of these, so I call it the elusive basswood or the American linden. Now again, this is a native tree. Uh, when we do our Papscani walk, I know where this tree is and I always say, now we have to look for this tree. And one year I missed it entirely and we didn't get to see it. But I did see it yesterday, so I know it's still there. It's got very attractive sort of gray bark with kind of uh, fine ridges to it. Um, and why is this an interesting tree? Well, it's called basswood because in the old days, when they cut one of these down, they would use the inner bark, a layer below the outer bark, as bast. And bast was a very tough fiber that they could actually make into ropes and mats and things that uh, needed sort of a fibrous material. So that's where it gets its name, basswood. I always thought it had something to do with a fish, but it doesn't have anything to do with a fish. Um, it's a very interesting tree in that it has small flowers in the spring. And when the small flowers come along, they're very highly attractive to bees. And if you're a beekeeper and know how to do it, you can actually get your bees to make linden honey, which is very light in color and very uh, light in uh, texture. And you can get a prime amount of money for the linden honey. Now, again, this is a tree that isn't really used in the landscape too much because it's very large and it's not particularly tolerant of smoke and dirt and urban conditions, but there are European lindens that are used a lot in cities, uh, including Troy and places like that. Uh, just this is a little note, I found a hawthorn, one hawthorn tree growing at Papistani Island. I don't know what species it is, but again, kind of an interesting thing. And there's, I looked it up, there's 47 different native species of hawthorns in New York, so I'm gonna have to figure out what that one is. And occasionally we see odd trees, a lone white pine growing at Papscani Island. This is not a species that is really tolerant of flooding conditions or flood plains, but here we have one growing off in the distance and we have one weeping willow here uh, growing in the distance. So you can see some interesting things if you really keep your eyes peeled. And one plant that we really don't like, so I put this in here as a note, is the tree of heaven. Now this is an invasive, it comes from Asia and it's really proliferating in the Hudson Valley in our area. You can see it's got kind of a compound leaf to it. It makes lots of seeds that spread around and sprout up. And it is at Papscani Island. It's along the railroad tracks. It's invading my backyard. So I do try to tell people about the Tree of Heaven. And uh, if you can pull this out, it's called Elampus altissima. And this was the tree that grew in uh, Brooklyn, right? in the movie and the book, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. So it's a symbol of rebirth and a symbol of being tough and resilient because it can grow out of a crack in the city, but we don't really want it growing all over the place. So we don't like it so much. And the bark of Elanthus is very smooth and gray and it has these compound leaves. Now you might say, this looks a lot like the walnut tree that you showed us. And yes, that's true. So how can you distinguish the two? The black walnut is on the left-hand side there. That's the bark of the black walnut. It's very ridged, it's very rough. The tree of heaven, which is not a good thing, is on the right-hand side. It's got very smooth bark. And one of the things I would do during our walk is break off a piece or a leaf of black walnut and a leaf of tree of heaven. And we do the smell test. And the smell of black walnut is kind of pungent and spicy, hard to describe. The tree of heaven stinks. It's a terrible, terrible stink. And once you smell it, you'll smell it all day. <laughs> and you'll know how to identify the tree of heaven. So if we were all together and doing this in person, we would do that. But take my word for it. If you ever see one of these tree of heavens, break off a piece and you'll smell it. It's something you won't like. And you'll learn how to identify it by that. Now, the last thing I want to show you is this oddity. This is not a plant, of course, but I found this on Monday was when I was at 
Papscani Island. It's called the giant puffball. It's a very large fungus in a white spherical form. This can be 20 to 35 inches in diameter, really anywhere from a softball to a beach ball in size. And this is one that people eat. Now, I'm not going to tell you to go eat this because I don't want you to mistakenly eat the wrong thing, but it is, if you know how to identify it, an edible fungus uh, before it makes its spores. Now, what happens inside this fungus is when it's in this stage here, it probably still is edible and it would be kind of this white flesh. Now, I am not a, a fungophile. I am not somebody that likes to eat a lot of mushrooms, but some people really rave about this. But as it ages, that inside turns into nine trillion spores. And this will eventually break open and smoky, uh, smoke-like uh, vapor will come out. These nine trillion spores will spread all over. So the puffball is a very interesting thing. This year is, seems to be, for some, whatever reason, a puffball year. I've seen a lot of these around and they're kind of fun to look at if you know what they are. So I would encourage you as we wrap up here to all visit Papuscany Island. I hopefully have triggered your interest in this beautiful little piece of nature that we have in Rensselaer County. I would say bring your bug spray, be tick prepared as we talked about in one of our previous uh, webinars. Enjoy the landscape. It's one of the things we can do during the pandemic is go out and ramble around. So hopefully I've piqued your interest and um, thank you for joining us.